All right, welcome back to the Refuting Calvinism YouTube channel. I haven't done a uh, video like this in quite some time, been quite busy lately. I uh, went to the Philippines for a couple weeks uh, back at the end of November, beginning of December, then visited some family, and just been trying to play some catch up since then. But hopefully, you've enjoyed the recent videos that have been uploaded to this channel. Um, we'll have a couple more videos regarding the Calvinism debate coming up soon. And um, I also hope to do a video on John Calvin and his life pretty soon, his situation with Michael Servetus. A lot of uh, revealing developments going on in that situation from what I've been reading. But anyways, today uh, this video <coughs> is going to be about another Calvinism stronghold. Uh, I did one on Romans 9 not too long ago, and um, hopefully that's helped a lot of people in seeing that the Calvinistic interpretation of that passage is just dead wrong. And I hope this video will do the same thing. Uh, John chapter 6 is probably the most popular, uh, well, the passage we're going to look at in John 6 is probably the most popular passage used by a Calvinistic apologist and uh, just regular Calvinist around the world to try to prove their theological system on soteriology. So we're going to look at this passage today. Uh, we're going to go back a little bit and, and get the whole context and uh, work our way up to John 6, 37 through 44. And today we're going to start stopping at verse 45. Uh, maybe in the future I'll make a, another video regarding verse 46 through the end of John 6. But to just put all of John 6 on one video, this it would just take be way too long of a video. I'm not sure how long this video will be, but uh, hopefully it won't be too long. So let's go ahead and get started, and we'll look at the context, uh, starting in John chapter 5 and verse 31. And uh, I'll stop periodically to comment on the verses that we're reading through. Before we get there, uh, let's just look at the context here of what uh, who Jesus is talking to here. Uh, and in John chapter 5, starting in verse 31, Jesus is talking to uh, the Jews who wanted to kill him. Uh, they wanted to kill him because he had just healed a man on the Sabbath, and according to them, that was a, a big no-no. Um, and also, they wanted to kill him because he said that God was his father, uh, making himself equal to God. So he's talking to people who want to kill him. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and start uh, reading in John chapter 5 and verse 31. Jesus said, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There's another who bears witness of me. And I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent to John. And he has borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. So in verse 34, just stop there for a second. Uh, Jesus says that uh, when he refers to verse 33, that you sent people to John to ask him, you know, who he was and who I was. Uh, he says, I do not receive testimony from man. He said, that's not why I'm saying this. Uh, but he said, I say that you may be saved. Um, now, the interesting thing here is the, the Greek word for saved here is sozo, or may be saved is sozo. And sozo here is in the subjunctive. And um, in subjunctive, when a Greek word is in the subjunctive, it's simply talking about what may or may not be. Uh, it's dealing with possibilities or probabilities. Uh, so in this situation, the ones that are listening could possibly be saved in the future, or could possibly not be saved in the future because it's an open possibility or probability uh, because uh, it hasn't been decided, uh, which goes directly against Calvinism because in Calvinism, uh, God decided eternity past. He picked and, cho and chose who was going to be saved and who wouldn't be saved. Uh, so subjunctive should never be used when it comes to salvation. Uh, but it's being used here regarding these people who want to kill him, the people who Jesus are talking to. He basically is putting it, the ball in their court and saying it's up to them. So this subjunctive is very important to remember uh, for the rest of this video, especially when we get to John chapter 6. All right, let's read on. Uh, he was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. Now notice in verse 35 that Jesus says they were willing, which means they had a will. Uh, they weren't forced to, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to rejoice in his light for that period of time. Uh, they were willing to. They chose to. Uh, rejoice in his light for a period of time. So let's read on. Verse 36. But I have a great witness, a greater witness than John's, for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Uh, so the works he has done uh, regarding his miracles and signs and wonders, and the works he will do on the greatest sign of wonder, which is rising from the grave. 
and bear and listen to the world. Uh, verse 37, The Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form, but you do not but you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent you do not believe. So why do these people not have uh, the Father's word abiding in them? Because they do not believe in the one that the Father has sent, Jesus. Uh, so it's not the other way around. Uh, as the Calvinists would say, that, uh, that, that you have to be regenerated first before you can believe. He's saying you don't have the, uh, the word abiding in you, because who the Father sent you do not believe in him. Uh, verse 39, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. You notice that the Jesus says here, you're not, doesn't say you're not able to come to me, which is what it should say if Calvinism is true. Total inability, total depravity. You are not able, if you're not chosen by God, you're not able to come to him. He says you are not willing to come to me that you may have life, which presupposes they have some kind of will that they could come if they were willing to come. Uh, so they were not willing to come to him that they may have life. And the may have life here, uh, may have is the Greek word echo, and it's in the subjunctive once again. So there's a possibility that they could get eternal life in the future if they were to change their not willing to willing. So we have a subjunctive again, which is dealing with possibilities, probabilities, what may or may not be. It is not settled, uh, when it, so it's not an eternal decree that God... Uh, wills them not to be saved or wills them to be saved. Uh, let's read on. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. Well, why don't they have the love of God in them? Because God eternally decreed they wouldn't have the love of God in them? No, because they have not believed in the one that the Father has sent. That's why the word of God is not abiding in them. If the word of God is abiding in them. If they believed in the one that the Father had sent, in Jesus Christ, then they would have the love of God in them. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe? Good question. Who receive honor from one another, and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God. So, why can't they believe according to Jesus? They can't believe because they seek honor from one another, instead of seeking the honor which only comes from God. They could choose to stop seeking honor from one another and, and seek the honor that comes from God alone. Uh, but as at this point in time, they're not willing to do that. They're not willing to come to him. They're not willing to believe. They're not willing to have the love of God in them or abide in it or have his word abiding in them. So uh, that that's why uh, they don't have the love of God in them and that's why uh, they're still seeking after honor from one another instead of honor that only comes from God. All right, verse 45. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my writings? Keep in mind that Jesus says here that they're putting their trust in Moses. Uh, it'll be important to remember that here in a, in a minute. It is the law of Moses that accuses them. The law that was given to Moses by God, directly from God. No amount of obedience to the law of God, to the law of Moses could forgive them of their past disobedience to the law, but they're putting their trust in Moses, putting their trust in Moses' law, but trusting Moses' law will not save them because they need forgiveness of sins. They need the sacrificial lamb of God uh, who could take away their sins and the sins of the world. But since they were rejecting him, not believing in him, um, they uh, are be still stand accused by Moses and his law and stand under the judgment and wrath of God because they haven't obeyed his law completely, as no one has. All right, verse, uh, let's move on to verse 47. It says, uh, it says that, once again, but if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe in my, my words? Believing in Moses' writings, specifically about Jesus, would have led them to believe in Jesus and what he had to say. Uh, Jesus doesn't reveal any specific thing that Moses is talking about, that he's talking about here, referring to what Moses said about him, but he simply is under the assumption that they should have known better. Uh, by having Moses' writings, having the law of God, having all the prophecies about Jesus in Moses' writings, in the first five books of the Bible, they should have known that he's the Messiah and that he was coming to the world and what he would be like. But since they, uh, they, re they, they didn't really uh, believe Moses' writings, how can they believe in Jesus' words? So, 
that's a prerequisite to believing in Jesus' words. Alright, let's move on to chapter 6 here. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs, which he performed, on those who were diseased. Now, right here in verse 2, it says, the reason they're following him at this point, at this point in time, in this passage, in this situation, the reason they're following him is because he did these signs. But later on, it's going to change. Uh, but initially, they were following him because of the signs he performed. Let's move on to verse 3. And Jesus went on up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up, lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the man sat down in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves. When he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to the disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, so that nothing is lost. Now keep in mind here, they had as much as they wanted, and they were filled. That will be important for later on when Jesus switches from the natural to the spiritual. Let's read on verse 13. Therefore they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. And those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who is coming to the world. Therefore when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. So you see here that they realize the signs that he's doing, specifically the sign he just did, uh, feeding the whole 5,000 with five bar loaves and two fish, uh, that he was the prophet who was to come, the prophet. And they were trying to make him king by force uh, because of this. Uh, and when he, when he saw this, he departed to be by himself. He just knew that his first coming wasn't about being a king. It was about being a suffering servant. It wasn't until his second coming that he would come as a conquering king. The Jewish people were all mixed up in regards to this, as usual, when it comes to the Messiah. They thought that the Messiah's first coming would be to deliver them from the oppression and bondage of the Romans and other earthly principalities. But the Messiah came to deliver them in his first appearance from a much more serious and eternal enemy, and that is sin. As you will see in the upcoming verses, they had their eyes on earthly things and did not understand what Jesus was saying to them all at all. They constantly were confusing the spiritual things that Jesus said with earthly things that Jesus was not referring to. Right, let's move on. In verse 16, Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose, because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except that, which, that one which his disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone, however, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they, had, they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Notice that Jesus doesn't even really answer their question that they ask him, but goes directly to their hearts. In the state of their hearts. He says uh, that they're now seeking him, not because of the signs, because they ate of the loaves and were filled. So notice the change here. Something happened here. They're, they're seeking him, not because of the signs now, because they ate the loaves and were filled. Verse 27, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. 
because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then Jesus tries switching their thinking from earthly things to spiritual things, using the example of food, which is already on their mind. Uh, just like earthly food provides sus sustenance needed to continue living in our temporal form here on earth, spiritual food provides what is needed in order for a person to have eternal life. Notice also that Jesus is telling them to labor, which means they must do something in order to have eternal life. Which means that doing something to have eternal life isn't work salvation, as the Calvinists always try to say. Uh, doing something isn't work salvation, because Christ commands them to do something. In verse uh, 28, let's move on to that. Then I said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? They asked a great question there. What must we do? Uh, notice what they said, though. What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Now, did Jesus correct them and say, you can't do anything to be saved? Or did Jesus say, that's work salvation, you heretics, repent? No, he didn't say that. He told them that what work they must do in order to have eternal life and work the works of God. In verse 29, he reveals to them what it is. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. The work of God that they must do, they must do this, is believe in him whom the Father sent, which is Jesus. This is something that they, they are required to do this. Not God, not Jesus, they are required to do it. Let's read on to verse 30. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the man in the desert, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. They asked Jesus for a sign, as if he hadn't given them enough signs as it is. That he would perform so that they might believe him. Remember now, they weren't seeking him because of the signs. They were seeking him because they ate and were filled. This should explain why, after asking for a sign, they went right back to food uh, when bringing up the manna that was in the desert. I also want to point out that, they, that when they say, see it here, they want to see a sign that Jesus will perform. Uh, they are talking about literally seeing a sign with their literal physical eyes. That's what they're talking about here. This will be important for later on when we get to the meat of John chapter 6. Let's go on to verse 32. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. Jesus must have seen into their hearts when they said uh, in verse 31, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. He must have seen that when they said He gave them bread from heaven to eat, that they were in their hearts thinking Moses instead of thinking God who really gave him the manna from heaven to eat, because he basically corrects them. Without them coming out and saying it was Moses, that he corrects them and says, Moses was not the one who gave you the manna in the desert. It was God who gave you the manna in the desert. And so what Jesus is really revealing here, once again, is that they were putting their trust in Moses. And that's why I told you to remember what John 5, 45 says. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. So they put their trust in Moses, and now in their hearts they were saying, at least, because Jesus is correcting them, that Moses is the one who gave them this manna from heaven. But Jesus said, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. He wanted to take their focus once again off the literal, physical bread that only sustains physical life, and put their focus back on the true bread from heaven, which can give them eternal life. All right, let's move on to verse 33. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. What is the true bread from heaven that gives life to the world? It is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Once again, just like the manna helped to, uh, helped to sustain physical life and keep them living temporally here on earth, the true bread would provide what was needed to bring eternal life to the people. And who did Jesus give his life to? Just the elect? No, to the world. To the world Jesus gave his life to. Let's go on to verse 34. Then I said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. 
you know, it really shows that they really misunderstood what he was saying. Because they're asking for this bread always, like as if he's still talking about literal physical bread. But the bread is standing right before them. He's looking at them face to face, and they still don't see it. Verse 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus reaffirms to him that, to them that he is the bread of life. Not some literal physical bread, but that he himself individually is the bread of life. That he was right there before them. Comes and believes in this verse are synonymous. They are talking about the same thing, just like hunger and thirst are synonymous. Just like little, literal drink and literal food satisfies literal hunger and thirst and provides sustenance to maintain physical life, Jesus, the true bread, provides true spiritual satisfaction to the believer and provides what they need in order for them to have eternal life, his sacrifice on the cross. Now the Calvinists will look at these verses and, and see, never hunger, never thirst, say, look, they can't lose their salvation because if they did, they would begin to hunger and begin to thirst again. But there's a problem with this. Believes, which is the Greek word pisteo, is in the present active. Young's literal makes this verse a little clearer for us. It says, he who is believing in me may not thirst at any time. There must be a present believing for there not to be a present thirst or hunger. Those who are presently believing will not hunger or thirst at any time. So this idea of never thirsting or never hungering does not go against the idea of someone falling away, being cut off, or backsliding, or uh, departing from the faith, or what is commonly called losing your salvation. This will go against that idea, because there must be a present belief. In fact, I would say this, never, this, this verse supports uh, the falling away, departing from the faith, and being cut off, because if someone stopped believing... If they weren't presently believing, they had departed from the faith, they would begin to be thirsty and hungry once again. All right, let's move on to verse 36. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe in me. Once again, Jesus is talking about seeing with literal physical eyes, seeing him face to face, and Jesus seems like he's surprised here. Uh, they would not believe in him, even though they see him with their own literal physical eyes. Eyes. It makes me think of that of what Jesus said to Thomas when Thomas said, "I will not believe in him until I see his the, ne the holes in his hands and in his wrists and or, or in his side." And uh, Jesus said to him, "Blessed are you that you believe, but blessed are those who do not see and believe." Talking about literal physical eyes here. All right, now we're getting to the part where uh, Calvinism starts to promote their doctrine from the from these scriptures here. So we've led up to this. Hopefully you've seen how it's important to go all the way back to John 5.31 to lead up to this point to give you an overall context. Now we're moving on to verse 37 which says this, And all the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Gives me is the Greek word uh, didom, didome, and it is, it is in the present active, which means that the Father is continuing to give people to Jesus as they come to him and believe in him, as verse 35 says. So they come to him, uh, they believe in him, synonymous in verse 35, and as they're coming to him and believing in him, the Father gives these people to Jesus. Okay? So there's a, a sense where he gives them to them at that point in time. But it's a continuous thing, it's in the present act, which means he's, he's continuing to give people to Jesus as they come to believe in Jesus. Will come to me is the Greek word hecho, and it is in the future active indicative. This means that it's something that will happen in the future, and it is referring to the sum total of all believers who, were, who are given to Jesus by the Father. So the sum total of all believers who are given to Jesus by the Father as they believe, as they come, will, be, uh, will come to Jesus in the near, and it will in the future, at some point in time in the future. And the second part of this verse where it says, and the one who comes to me, it is referring to the individuals who make up the sum total of all of the believers who will be given to him in the future. So we have uh, the ones who are given to him as they come to him and believe. Uh, they will come to him in the future. And we'll talk about what that means here in a second. And, uh, and then there's 
ones who will come to him, which is referring to the individuals who make up the sum total of all the believers who will, who will be given to him in the future. Of course, Jesus will never cast, cast away or, or push away or cast out any believers because he desires for all to be saved and for none to perish. Uh, he desires for every believer to persevere to the end. He doesn't want them to fall away from the faith and depart from the faith. He wants them to persevere until the end. But this future coming that is referring to at the beginning of this verse could very well be referring to the, same, to the same future day that is spoken of at the end of verse 39 and verse 40, which says, the last day. That that's the day, just in the future, that they will come to Jesus because they've already been given to him over time as they come and believe in him. They will come to him, which really uh, gives a good picture of the wedding feast of the Lamb, the bride and the bridegroom. The bride will be given it will come and be given to Jesus Christ at that point in time. So if, if this coming is referring to, the, that's at the beginning of this uh, verse here, is referring to the last day, which I believe it is, uh, then it is no wonder why Jesus would, won't cast them out. They've already persevered to the end at that point. They've made it all the way to the end, so there's no reason to cast them out. Uh, they've persevered to the end, so they will be saved, finally. All right, verses 38 and 39. For I've come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. So Jesus reaffirms to them that he doesn't come to his will, but the will of the Father. And according to Jesus, what is the will of the Father uh, that he speaks of here? Uh, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Uh, given me, here, is the Greek word didome, once again, and it is in the present active, oh, I'm sorry, perfect active indicative. When a Greek word is in the perfect active, active indicative, it is referring to a completed action whose effects are felt in the present. So it's, this given to him has already been completed. It's like in the past tense here. It's already been given to him. So who are uh, the all that, the all that the Father has already given to Jesus and his 12 disciples. Those are the ones who he has already given to Jesus. It must be since Jesus already referred to a group that would be given to him continuously, present active indicative, and verse 37, as they come and believe, as verse 35 says, that same group, the same group can't be given to him continuously and already be given to him as a completed action in the past. So he's talking about two different groups here. So, verse 37 is talking about a group that's continuously given to Jesus over time as they believe in him and trust in him and come to him. But verse 39 is referring to a group that has already been given to him. So, it's referring to the disciples. And uh, this interpretation of this, being in the disciples, uh, is, coincides very clearly with John chapter 17, verses 6 through 12. So, let's turn there just for a second. This, Jesus is Jesus talking here. This is his high preachly prayer, and he says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you, for I have given to them the words which you have given to me, given me, and they re have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. All six times, you, you see the, the Greek word didomi, used six times in these seven verses, John 17, 6 through 12. Six times. Uh, it's translated as either gave or have given. So it's used six times. All six times didomi in this passage is, is in the aorist, which is used when talking about something that happened in the past. So here we have once again, you go back to John uh, 6.39, uh, 
It's something that's already been done. It's in the perfect, talking about the past tense here. It's a completed action which has, uh, con uh, which effects are which effects are felt in the present. And now we have in John 17, uh, verses 6 through 12, six times didomi is used again, but now it's in the aorist, referring to a past action as well, and it's talking about the disciples specifically. So I think both passages, or John 17, 6 through 12, and John 6, 39, are both talking about the disciples who were already given to Jesus by the Father. Okay, so that's what it's talking about in both of us. And I believe that it's talking about... Uh, so what, what is the will of the Father concerning the disciples who have already been given to Jesus? Well, let's see what it says again. Uh, the will of the Father is that all that he has given me, I shall lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. The Greek word translated as should lose is apolemi, and is in the subjunctive. And remember we talked about subjunctive before. Subjunctive uh, deals with what may or may not be. It deals with possibilities or probabilities, or not uh, something that's fixed, okay? Um, so that means that losing, that the losing the Father doesn't want to happen, is talking about what may or may not be, what may or may not happen. It's dealing with possibilities or probabilities. Uh, the Greek word translated as should raise is anistomai, and it, it is in the subjunctive as well. You can tell they both have words should in front of it. Uh, they're both in the subjunctive. That means that the raising up of the Father wants to happen is talking about what may or may not be. It is dealing with possibilities or probabilities. So when it comes to those who have already been given to Jesus, the disciples, uh, it is yet to be seen whether they will be lost or not and whether they will be raised or not. In fact, according to John 17, 12, as we just read, one that was given to Jesus was lost. His name is Judas. Now, this video isn't going to be addressing Judas and his situation in, in great detail. Um, but if you want to watch a video that I, that I have already done that I think makes it abundantly clear that Judas was at one point in time saved and then became lost, uh, just click right here and you can watch that video. It's titled, Judas Was Saved. Okay. Um, so, what this proves to me uh, is that people who were given to Jesus, had already been given past tense, or perfect tense, or heirs tense, uh, one of them will not be raised up at the last day. So this proves to me that God's will isn't always done as the Calvinist says. You know, even if Judas wasn't specifically lost, it was, let's just say for, you know, just for, uh, just for a second that Judas did persevere to him, he wasn't lost, and that there wasn't a scripture that he had to fulfill concerning that. Um, the fact that it's that this scripture says should lose nothing and should raise him up at the last day, and that these are in the subjunctive proves that God's will may or may not be done. Since the subjunctive deals with possibilities or probabilities and not definite decree as Calvinism does. Because Calvinism teaches that uh, all things whatsoever come to pass have been decreed or ordained by God. Let's move on to verse 40. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The seeing here, once again, is referring to, as we've seen already, in verses 30 and verses 36 of John 6, is referring to those who are seeing him with their physical eyes, literally seeing him. Okay, that's the seeing people we're talking about here. Not someone who's in the future, who can't see him because Christ is already gone believes in him, which is, uh, you know, halfway through here, is, halfway through the verse, is the Greek word pisteo, once again, and it's in the present active. So this is referring to those who are seeing Jesus literally with their physical eyes, and are presently, at the time that Jesus is speaking, are believing in him. And what is the will of him who sent Jesus, the Father, concerning those who are seeing Jesus and currently believing in him? Well, the will is that they may have each everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. May have everlasting life. May have is the Greek word echo, and it's in the subjunctive, once again, which means that whether or not the ones who are currently seeing Jesus and believing him will have eternal life is yet to be seen. 
this possibility, this probability that they may or may not be saved. So it's what, dealing with may or may not be saved. Uh, not some eternal decree as Calvinism promotes and teaches. So it is possible that those who were at that time seeing Jesus and believing in him will not, in the end, have everlasting life. I will, will raise him up at the last day is the Greek word anistomai again, and it's in the future active indicative. It's obviously referring to the resurrection when God the Father will give the total sum of all believers who persevered until the end to Jesus, including those who are seeing him face to face and believing him currently if they persevere to the end. So that, that's, that's what it's talking about, the future active indicative. So we, if we just stop right here just for a second, we see that Jesus addresses three different groups. Number one, all general believers who will ever believe in him. We see this in verse 37. They'll be continually given to Jesus as they come and believe in him. Number two, the disciples who are already given to him. We see this in verse 39. It's in the perfect tense there. And you go to John 17, you see six examples of didomi, and it's used in the air. It's talking about a past action as well. And then number three, the people who are currently alive, seeing Jesus face to face and believing in him. That's the whole spectrum there. Those who will believe him all time and are constantly given to Jesus by the Father as they come to him and believe in him. Then there's the disciples who already were given to Jesus by the Father. And then those who are currently seeing him and believing in him. Those are the three groups that are addressed uh, in verses 37 through 40. All right, let's move on to verse 41. The Jews then com complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is this not Je is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. The Jews complain about what Jesus is saying here because they still have their minds set on earthly things like food, literal food, literal hunger, literal thirst, and whether or not Jesus existed before his earthly birth. So Jesus tells them to stop murmuring. Verse 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. We've already seen that coming to Jesus and believing in Jesus are synonymous. They're the same thing in this passage. So, no one can believe in Jesus, or no one can come to Jesus without the drawing of the Father. And there's no problem with the drawing of the Father being needed for a sinner to come or to believe in Jesus. I have no problem with that. I believe that. The question that is raised is this. Does the Father only draw a few, or does he draw all? Because Calvinists would assert from this scripture that he only draws some. Uh, the answer is that he draws all at some point in time in their lives, as John 12, 32 says. So who are the ones that Jesus will raise up at the last day, according to this verse? Uh, they are the ones who come, not the ones who are drawn. Since not everyone who is drawn will come, because everyone is drawn at some point in time in their lives, and everyone who is drawn will come, then we have universalism. And those are the two spectrums you have. You have Calvinism, and you have universalism. You have everyone who has been drawn will come, and only a few are drawn. Or you have everyone who is drawn will come, and all are drawn. That's universalism. Uh, but this verse isn't saying that all who are drawn will raise up the last day, but all who come or believe and continue to come and believe, as we've seen from the other verses we've looked at, will be raised up at the last day. Verse 45, This and this verse will help clarify verse 44. It is, it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. The Father draws people how? By teaching them. That's how he draws them, by teaching them. Not by regenerating, monergistically regenerating their heart and forcing them to come to him, forcing them to believe, but by teaching them. And who does the Father teach according to this verse, verse 45? All. He teaches all. And, and you know, this teaching that the Father does to all is something that we cannot resist. It's something that God forces on us. 
Uh, the fact that we're all taught by God or all drawn by God at some point in time is something we cannot change and cannot resist. What God has decreed will happen. It's unchangeable. God will draw everyone at some point in time, and he will teach everyone at some point in time. We, can't also, we also can't change the fact that God, that the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So we can't change the fact that God will convict us, uh, that he will draw us, that he will teach us at some point in time. These are the things that the Father forces on us. But they are only influence and not causation. Drawing, convicting, and teaching are influence, not causation. For not all who are taught by the Father will come to Jesus, according to verse 45. It's only those who learn that will come to Jesus. Learning implies a submission or, apl or applying of what has been taught to the learner or to the student. So if someone's teaching me something and I want to learn from it, I have to actually apply it and submit to it. Uh, you know, when I was in high school, there's a lot of things I was taught, but I don't remember much of it because I didn't learn it. Uh, sometimes it might have been because it was the teacher's fault. Uh, but when it comes to God teaching, it's never the teacher's fault. So it must be the student's fault that they didn't learn, they didn't submit uh, to this understanding. In fact, the Greek word here is manthano, and it means come to learn, implying reflection on the information. The people who are taught by God must come to learn after reflecting upon the information that is given to them by God. Unfortunately, most don't do this. Most either let it go in one ear or out the other, or could care less what God is trying to teach them, that the Holy Spirit is trying to convict them, that, that God's trying to draw them through the, through the teaching of the Word of God. This means that although we are all drawn through the teaching of the Father, we must submit to that teaching before we can come to Jesus or believe in Jesus. And isn't this exactly what the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17? It says this, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We hear the word of God. We're taught by it. We learn from it through reflection. We have faith in it. We believe in it. And we apply it to our lives. That's what, that's what a person must do. That's how a person becomes a Christian. That's how a person gets salvation. Okay, so just for conclusion review to wrap up this video. Uh, I may do another video once again on the rest of John 6 in the future. But I think there's a need for it. Uh, right now I don't want to make this video an hour and a half long, which would, it probably would be. It'd be double the size that it's going to be. Uh, I think that what I have said in this video, though, is, is sufficient enough to prove that John 6, 37 through 44, the verses that are really in question here that the Calvinists try to use to promote Calvinism, do not teach the doctrine of Calvinism. More specifically, it does not teach total depravity slash inability, but it does teach that man must be drawn by the Father to believe or come to Jesus. It does not teach unconditional election, or that God is picking or choosing who will be saved and who will not be saved. The ones that the Father gives to the Son are those who have already believed and are continuing in belief. The only ones that were given to the Son at, at that point in time were the disciples, and one of them departed from the faith later on. The rest are given to the Son as they come to believe and will be given to the Son in the future if they continue in that belief, in that faith. This passage also does not teach irresistible grace. Rather, it teaches that God draws all men through the influence of teaching, and that he must submit to that teaching or learn from it in order to come or believe in Jesus. It also does not teach perseverance or preservation of the saints. Rather, it teaches that those who are currently believing may or may not have everlasting life in the end, and may or may not be raised at the last day, because of the subjunctive. So, hopefully this video uh, makes sense to you. Hopefully uh, it was clear. And hopefully you can see that, once again, one of the strongholds of Calvinism, John chapter 6, does not promote or teach the doctrines of Calvinism. In fact, teaches the exact opposite. And I pray that you're open to this, that you'll receive this, uh, that you study to show yourself approved of the God and, and, and look into this for yourself. Uh, I look forward to en engaging with you on, on this in the discussion below the video. Uh, remember to keep the discussion cordial and Christ-like and to keep the discussion on the content of this actual video, not veering off into other passages that you think teach the doctrines of Calvinism, like Romans 9, which I already have a video on, or Ephesians 1, etc. 
stick to this uh, passage. So that's it for now. Uh, God bless you. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And until next time, that's it.